all move over there because we got to grab tools and stuff. Too. The heat coils uh, are going to be spaced about 18 inches. So we're going to put a heat coil down, 18 inches of fuel source on top of that, another heat coil, 18 inches of fuel on top of that. cylinder pile um, really it's it's the, the prominent person to kind of start this and get this idea going was Jean Payne he was a French um, a Frenchman and he worked with the um, the native uh, restoration in uh, in France in the late 70s early 80s and so he was coming through these areas and he had all this like scrub brush that he was like I need to get rid of this so he would come through, cut it down, and he would uh, shred it up. And so he, he was like, okay, I have this huge waste material, like what can I do with this? And so what he actually started doing is he started creating these big piles, running the piping through the pile, and then running it back to his house, but also to provide radiant heat for his home, but then also um, to provide the hot water for his home. One thing that he also did that we're not doing today because it's a little bit more technical is he put a cylinder in the center of the pile and what he would do is he would fill it with, uh, with manure and different waste and he would cap it and connect a hose to it and so as the bio, the, the wood chip pile heated up it would actually um, start to decompose the manure on the inside and create methane gas and so what he would do is the hose would be connected to the top and the methane gas would rise and he would actually compress and pull it into um, car inner tube tires. And so very, very low tech way, but he would store that and he would use it for cooking in his home. And then he eventually actually converted his car to run on methane. So this, one of these big piles that he put together would, you know, would, would heat his home, heat his hot water, provide his cooking, uh, uh, cooking fuel, and also get him into town and back. So um, very, very creative individual. His piles, a little bit bigger than what we're going to be building today, sometimes 25 feet high and 35, 40 feet wide. So we're talking large piles to do this. Um, so, but we're going to be a little bit smaller today. Um, a little bit other, another kind of low tech way is uh, an example is like growing power in Milwaukee. If you're familiar with them, what they do is they put their compost piles on the inside of the greenhouse in order to capture the heat in the greenhouse, but then also um, it's beneficial for the CO2 that's released in the decomposition process that helps um, uh, feed, feed the plants and help them grow a little bit bigger and better. Um, and Native Power, which is a German company, has been working in 2000s presence and um, they're one of the good resources out there. You have to translate things from their website. Um, but they've uh, been building them all over Europe, Denmark, Germany, France, England, um, and they're really starting to get this moving. They focus on uh, the educational aspect and helping people build these and get the word out. Um, so they do good stuff. Um, so kind of the basic history behind uh, where we are so far. Basic idea, rock equals hot, right? When you combine um, chipped or manure, the nitrogen, carbon, put them together, it's hot, so very basic. So what's causing the heat? What's causing the, that breakdown? Well, one of the things that's working on that, as some of you may know, is bacteria. So uh, bacteria, the way that they uh, decompose material is they actually secrete chemicals. And what happens is those chemicals create oxidation, which in turn creates heat. So the, the byproduct of them, uh, uh, the chemical reaction of them decomposing the material is you get heat as a byproduct. Very basic level of this. Lots of different varieties of bacteria and different heat levels determine the different bacteria that are part there. So that's on a basic level. Also, we have fungi, right? So fungi are, um, when we think of fungi, a lot of times think, people think mushrooms, right? So you see your mushroom that you eat, right? That is actually just the fruit of the organism. The, the body of the organism is uh, called mycelium. And so mycelium likes to feed on cellulose material, so it likes carbon, likes to munch on it. And so it spreads itself across the carbon material and also secretes chemicals to, to break down that, um, that cellulose to release the nutrients that it feeds on. 
some very cool stuff with mycelium. I am a huge mushroom fan and mycelium freak. Um, but it's an amazing organism. Uh, they, they believe the largest organism in the world is actually an organ. It's a mycelial uh, a network um, that runs through one of the forests. Um, they have been known to uh, create uh, relationships with plant roots. And so there's two types, endo and ecto uh, mycelium. And so endo, they penetrate the root of the plant. And then ecto, they latch onto the outside. The cool thing about that is they're actually uh, able to transport not only nutrients but water from sometimes 20, 25 feet away, even longer, and they'll bring it and provide it to the plant roots in exchange for the food that the plants, the starches that the plant is providing, uh, the mycelium. So awesome, uh, beneficial relationship. And so fungi is another great thing that breaks down that material and creates that chemical process that starts to release that heat. Um, so biomimular overview. This is similar to what we're going to be uh, building today. Basically, giant pile of wood chips or a combination of wood chips and manure and sawdust. Um, ideally, um, the, the components that I, we would have liked to have happened today is we have lots of box elder out there and we we're hoping to get, bring somebody in to cut down the box elder, chip it up so it's nice and fresh. We would then know the fuel source, right? So it would be one type. We know we're dealing with box elder. We know that it's fresh. It's below, it's less than six inches in diameter. And the key to that is you have a better carbon to nitrogen ratio when you have smaller wood like that. Um, you have the less of the cellulose as in a, in a larger tree. So, but things happen. And so we are, weren't able to get the chipper, uh, somebody to come in and chip. So next best thing, there was a, there's a company that works out of Partyville, Wisconsin that does tree trimming. They were able to actually come and drop off uh, wood chips as on their way back to Partyville. So the great thing about that is it also saved on, uh, on gas. So, you know, the, when you're looking at a biomiller, you also have to think about in any type of energy use, you want to think about the life cycle energy of what you're building, right? So not only are we offsetting propane, but we need to think about what kind of external energy inputs have gone into creating this. So that's something to think about. Um, so uh, we'll be working with today is some of the fresh chips. We have some older chips as well that we'll be including in there. Not ideal, the fresher the better, right? But it's what we could get our hands on. And we also have some manure that we're gonna be supplementing the pile with. So that's just the basic overview. This is what the pile looks like. And uh, I'll be explaining more about the construction of it when we're actually doing it. So we'll be a little bit hands-on. We'll talk about it uh, when we move forward. So basic system components that we're working with. Like I was talking about outside earlier, um, we have heat exchange coils. So the heat, if some of you are familiar with a solar hot water system or a ge geothermal system, it's the basic similar, pr uh, similar principles. We have two sets of heat exchange coils, one that is pulling heat out of the compost pile and another uh, heat exchange coil that's actually gonna be in the form of piping running underneath their grow beds in the greenhouse, which is going to release the energy, the warmth into the greenhouse. And then the water will be pumped back out to the heat exchange coils in a loop. So we have those two sets of heat exchange coils. Um, the, the next thing is we have uh, some heat exchange manifolds. So manifolds, if you think about it is, so we have all these layers of coils, heat exchange coils layered in the compost pile. We're gonna have piping coming out. What we're gonna be creating is a manifold, which is a connection on the outside of the pile that connects uh, the heat exchange coils to each other and we're going to be running the water through those. So we're going to have one manifold there on the side of the compost pile. We're also going to have one manifold running horizontally in the greenhouse that, and that's where the piping is going to go from this manifold and down the length of the grow beds to bring the heat out that way. So we'll have a manifold in the greenhouse bringing the heat into the greenhouse. We'll have a manifold on the outside of the compost pile helping to bring that heat and water out of the compost pile. So yes. is that doing like any kind of insulation for it? Like how do you prevent heat loss from that? Yep. So what we're gonna be doing is um, we have pipe wrap insulation is one thing. So we're gonna be wrapping the pipes. 
but we're also, as we build, once we build up the manifold, we'll actually be taking hay bales and cutting slits on them and pushing them up on top of the manifold to provide that, you know, that, that insulation and that protection from the outside elements. So the, the biomealer itself is going to be surrounded by straw bales, I should say straw bales, and then the manifold will be in, included in that encased surrounding. So ideally what it's going to look like when we're done is it's going to look like a giant cylinder of straw bales that have been encased, that are encased in the biofilm. So we have the, those two uh, heat exchange manifolds. Um, then uh, what Tyler and I uh, termed it as the supply and return umbilical runs. And so that's going to be the run of pipe in between the biomealer and the greenhouse. And how that's going to work is we have the piping, we're going to wrap it in pipe wrap. We also have a three inch drainage tile that we're gonna feed over the top of that pipe wrap. And then we're gonna take straw bales and lay one layer of straw bales on the ground. Then we're gonna cut, we're gonna take and we're gonna cut out little grooves in the straw bales and put the, put the drainage tile with the pipe in there. Then we're gonna take another bale of hay and we're gonna cut some more uh, divots in it and then we're going to stack it on top of it, kind of like a sandwich. And so the idea is we're going to have this run of straw bales and the pipe is going to be sandwiched inside of there. And if we have enough chi wood chips uh, left over, what the plan is is then to kind of seal that off and protect that, we're going to pile wood chips on top of that. So in order to kind of seal that from the, uh, from the elements. Now uh, what you could do and what other people have done is they bury the runs a little bit more intensive. Um, for our climate, we, we want to go down at least six feet. And so you're talking like a big, deep trench. And so for this first run, we want to kind of experiment and see how it works out. Um, because yes, the heat loss is, you want to pay particular attention to that. And the closer that you can keep the biomealer to your heat source, the less heat loss you're going to have. We are going to be keeping it about 15 feet away just because of safety issues, just in case something happens and it tips or anything like that. We want to protect the greenhouse uh, because if that gets a hole in it, then this is kind of useless. So, um, so the, those, that's kind of the talk of the supply and return umbilical runs. And then the other component is going to be inside the greenhouse, and that's the water circulation pump. So um, we have a hot water circulation pump that we are going to be attaching on the inside. That's going to be pull. That's going to be pulling and pushing the water. Um, very simple, um, one sixteenth horse uh, hot water circulation uh, pump. Very commonly used in uh, plumbing applications for homes and that sort of thing. Um, it also has a variable speed um, control on it. So we want I spent a little bit more money on that, but it's going to come in handy because we'll be able to adjust the flow of the water of, um, with a pump motor. Um, so that way we can kind of zero in on the right flow for the amount of heat output that the pile is, is, is producing. So basic idea, we drew this up this week. So compost pile, right, heat exchange coils, this is, um, these are the cattle panels. So basically we're going to be coiling the pipe onto the cattle panel. The, the orange X marks are just an example. We're going to be zip tying. So this way, what this allows us to do is in the spring, we can grab onto the cattle panel with a tractor after we've un un unattached the manifold and just pull it out of the pile. Rather than if you just have it circled in the pile, you have to be more careful about, you know, working around it to get the piping out. And so this way, we can pull it out quick and then we can come in with a tractor and scoop and do what we want to do with the compost. Um, so that's that, the heat exchange coil. So greenhouse uh, heat exchange coil like I was talking about. Here are our hot, the manifold. So this is red highlight. Uh, it's red, if it's red highlight, that's our hot line. If it's cold, that is our cold line going back out to the, to the, to the compost pile. So. These two outside runs are going to be the, the, the hot runs, so the heat exchange coil is releasing. They come down to the end of the bed, connect down here, and then go up to the go back to the cold return manifold. And so this is all the same for all these the three the three grow beds. So the basic idea is it comes in hot, goes out the outside too, and hopefully releases its energy and then comes back into the cold, the cold connects, and then is gonna go back out to the, out to the biomealer, to the pile, um, uh, to get reheated. Um, this is, um, this is the, basically, 
one of the next slides. This is the pump interconnection, and it'll go. We'll go into more detail on that. All of this stuff we have. I have examples of it over there, so people, so as we're working through, people can see um, the different the different components of it. Um, I'll also um, be able to email these out to you. So I like to focus on keeping it low input in terms of materials as well. And a lot of people are using the digital stuff today, so um, these days. So I'll get this out to you in electronic form, so you can review. And if you need to use it in the future, if you construct your own. So the pile manifold, like I was talking about, that pile, that manifold that's going to be on running vertically on the outside of the compost pile. So we have the cold water return coming from the greenhouse. It's going to go in in one of the heat exchange coils. Then we're going to bring it out. And so what the red doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's hot. It's just warmer than the line before it that went into the pile. So it's going to come in coil. Go back out, connect up here, come in, coil, go back out. And so that's the basic idea as we're building up. So this is kind of the connection manifold. Once we get to the top, it's going to go into the final heat coil. It's going to come out here, and then it's going to travel back down and out to the greenhouse. So this is going to be the hot return line that's going to connect out. This, um, we are trying to figure out how we are going to charge the system um, because it is a closed loop system, so we want to get as much air out as possible, ideally no air within the system. And so what we came up with, well actually what Tyler came up with, um, was connecting a, a, a joint up here to a PVC ball valve. And so what this is, this is the highest point of the system, so when we're filling it, we'll have the PVC ball valve open to allow the air to escape out the top. And inside, what we're going to be using, we're going to be connecting a garden hose to a, uh, uh, a connection on the inside, turning on the garden hose to charge the system. So the garden hose is going to charge the system, is going to pump water into here, it's going to pump water into the heat exchange coils on the inside of the greenhouse. And once that fills up, what should happen is the air should come off the top of this. And once we start getting water shooting out the top, boom, we close the PVC valve. Um, to, uh, to kind of isolate the system to close it off. So, pile manifold. Umbilical lines, very simple, right? Hot, return cold, and with our connectors on each end. So, pile is going to be over here, greenhouse is going to be over here. So, very simple. So, we have the pump and, valve, uh, and fill valve. So, this is the connection that we were looking at. Um, so we've got the connectors coming in. We're going to have the the hot water, the cold water uh, on the cold water return, the pump. So this is the hot water pump that is going to be circulating the water. We also wanted to try and figure out how we could look at the system to see if there was any air within the system. So what we came up with very simple low tech idea is just a clear uh, a piece of clear vinyl hosing that we're attaching so we can look at the water as it's going through and we can see if there's any air bubbles coming through that sort of thing which will help us determine if we run across any leaks within the system. So this, um, the next thing that moves into, this is the fill connection. So we, we, caught, we figured out how to get a bunch of different connectors in order to attach the garden hose right here. So we'll have the PVC ball valve open as we're charging it. Once we shoot, see water shoot out of the top of that PVC uh, ball valve in the pile, we will close that one and close this one. And, it should be uh, a charge. So that's the basic idea. This is going back out to the pile is the cold return. So compost pile fuel sources. It is imperative, like I was talking before, comp the, the, the more clean and, uh, and even your, comp your fuel source, whether you're, uh, you know, you're using natural gas or gasoline, the purer it is, the more the more efficiency you get out of the more the more energy that you can generate out of it. So, if we're looking at an optimal mixture, like if if I could get my hands on any type of material, what we want to look at is 60 percent planter shavings, which is basically thin wood shavings, which are commonly you can commonly get at a lumber mill, that sort of thing, a woodworker, very very thin slivers of um, of wood shavings, 30 percent sawdust and about 10% of fresh manure. Ideally, that is like the optimal mix that you'll want to go with um, to get the most heat production. We don't have that, but we think we'll, we'll still be able to get some decent performance. It might be lower with what we have. Um, and 
All this will come as we're going to keep track of and keep uh, data on the performance, and that will be provided to you as well. What do you have? Hmm? What do you have? What are the ingredients? The ingredients, yeah. So we have currently we have roughly about 50%, 50 percent, 50 to 60 percent fresh shredded wood chips, which are the piles which the closer to the greenhouse. We have about 50 percent um, wood chips that are probably. Uh, month old, month and a half old, so there is some decomposition already happening in them. And then we have about 10% um, manure. So that's kind of like what we're working with, what we can get our hands on. So optimal, and what we have, that's what we have out there, um, is what we can get our hands on. So, um, yeah. Does it matter what kind of manure you use? Yeah, so um, it, it, it can. So. If you think about manure, the hotter the manure, the, the more it's the more nitrogen, the quicker it's going to break down. Um, like if you're using chicken manure, very hot, right? Um, cow manure, pretty hot. What we have is we have um, manure um, from a horse a horse stable, which is down the road. So that's what we're using. It does have some um, planter shavings and a little bit of sawdust in it. So we got a little bit more uh, up the percentage, a little bit more on that, just to make up for the the. The, the shavings and the sawdust that are currently in it. So you have to make sure too. You talked to a guy in Vermont that used compost for manure from cows, and that was treated. The cows have been treated with antibiotics. Yeah, so that's still all of them. My hope yeah, and so that's something that you want to take if you can get your hands on organic stuff that they haven't been, uh, you know, feeding chemicals, antibiotics. That should help with uh, to increase the the breakdown and and avoid the, the bacteria from um, running into that and not making it. So, thank you, Kate. Um, so, like I was saying, wood chips mixed here, what we're looking at, you know, is roughly about 50% fresh shredded wood chips, 40% uh, month old standard, kind of a little bit larger diameter wood chips, and then 10% fresh horse manure. Um, I just didn't put a picture of that because I figured it was on the last page and everybody should know what that looks like. So moisture and air. It's important to monitor the moisture and air as you're building the compost pile, right? So ideally the compost pile, we're looking for about 5% air content in the, in the compost pile. Now that will be determined upon what kind of uh, mixture you're using. The larger um, wood chips that you're using, that leads to more air within the pile. Um, whereas if you're doing all sawdust or, um, you know, more manure stuff, you're going to get less of the air in there. We're looking for about 5% air content in the pile. Um, moisture content range, we're hoping to get the pile up to about 40 to 60% in moisture range. Um, we don't have any expensive uh, moisture uh, you know, readers or, or probes or anything like that, but what I did pick up to see if we're going to work with it, see if it works, is um, just a standard moisture meter that you use for like checking moisture in a 2x4. Um, so as we're building the pile, we'll be able to kind of hopefully use that to try and get a rough idea. It is very basic, and ideally if, if we had more money and we were term teaming with a, if I would have thought about this a little bit further ahead, we would have teamed with like a UW uh, class or something like that to maybe help monitor this. But this is what we have, and we're, we're going to try and make it work today. So um, common failure factors um, for um, heat production not being uh, ideal drying out of the pile as bacteria and, and the organisms need they need that moisture in, or in order to feed them and to help them break down that material um, so we the idea is to try and get that that pile of the moisture get it insulated to try and keep that moisture in there so drying out of the pile one of the one of the issues too much moisture if it gets too wet it's basically closing out all the air gaps in there and so just like we need uh, we need to breathe as well so do bacteria and um, fungi and some of the other organisms that'll help break down the pile um, use of only large wood chips so standard large large scale wood chips that you might see that spread that is spread out for mulch um, in a garden right so the idea is you want to get the finer shredded um, wood chips the finer the material, um, the easier it is for the organisms to eat it, break it down, and get in there. And also, it helps uh, get the get the rough right uh, air composition within the pile. Um, 
Other big one that they have run into is the use of rot resistant wood, right? So if a wood is naturally rot resistant, the bacteria can't break it down and fungi can't break it down faster. And so you don't get that heat output. So common types of wood that you want to stay away from, black locust, hemlock, cedar, Douglas fir, any, any type of rot resistant wood you do not want to run into. So now when you're moving and sizing your pile, it can get kind of hairy and this is still a young, um, it's, not a, it's not a very studied area. So they're still trying to figure some of this stuff out, right? So fuel source, it really varies by the type of wood that you're using. Um, so a softer wood is going to break down quicker, going to give you a little bit more heat production versus like a hardwood. Um, also, what you're putting in, if you're using the perfect 60% of, uh, of fine shredded wood chips, 30% sawdust, 10% manure, you're going to get more heat output of that. The more, the more uh, pure your fuel source is, the more you can monitor that and get an idea of that. Um, I have, I, part of the research that I've done is in a book called Compost uh, Heated Hot Water by Galen Brown. He's out of Vermont. And out of the book, for a small size system, which is going to be smaller than what we're using, they're looking at roughly, if you get that perfect mixture, you're looking at roughly about 500 BTUs per hour per ton of material. That is very general, right? So it's, it's very hard to, to, when you're getting a, a source of fuel, wood chips from somebody who's going out and chipping, you kind of, you take what you have. So it might be a little bit of a lot of stuff. So. Um, but that's out of that book. That's kind of like a rough figure. He um, he estimates um, the one that we're going to be building today is going to be roughly about 19 feet wide by 10 feet tall. We're going to be using roughly 100 yards of 100 cubic yards of wood chips, and we estimated estimated base roughly putting out um, 2,800 28,000 BTUs per hour. Now um, we took off a little bit because. Of we don't have the ideal um, wood chip uh, uh, and makeup fuel source, and so we just drop that down. Um, so, very rough ideas. Um, if you want to get more into the science of that and the engineering of that, there's lots of good information in Galen's uh, Galen Brown's book, and then also um, through Native Power um, out of uh, Germany, they have a little bit more um, information on that, and I can get you pointed in those directions. So. Resources, Native Power out of Germany, uh, composting, compostpower.org is a group of, uh, of uh, individuals in Vermont and some industry um, people who have put together the website to try and get some and do some of the education and try and figure some of this out in order to get these things a little bit more reliable. So that's a great uh, resource. And then the Compost Powered, uh, Compost Powered Water Heater by Galen Brown, which is the book that I have over there. Great book. Um, it is, you know, I think it's uh, 12 bucks on Amazon. Um, if you want to pick it up, it's a great read. Lots of examples of, um, of the projects that people have done in the past. So lots of good stuff there. And any questions? Let's start off before we head out there and start working on stuff.